means that uh, let let your innermost being, you know, everything that involves your emotion, your rational, your imagination, everything, let it keep my commands. Okay, so that's God's will for us. That, um, that the word of God, the instruction in God's word, it's not an option, first of all, right? So it's not an option to either remember, forget, be convenient, uh, we pick and choose. No, it's not that. We ought to remember. But the other part is also that you let your heart, you know, your emotions, your everything within you keep meaning. First of all, you obey. And uh, the word keep means to guard, right? To guard it, let it not be stolen. You guard it. Let it establish you, let it, uh, you protect it, you nurture it. Because the word of God has power. The word of God uh, has um, life. The word of God is alive. Right? The word of God is what brings us, changes us from the inside out when we respond. Right? So let your heart keep my commands. Right? So I'm just reminded of that. And uh, let's let's pray, and let's um, let's just tell the Lord, Lord, I I want to keep your word. Okay? I esteem your word. Your word is precious. What you've spoken, what you've you know the written word of God, what you're prompting me in our hearts, um, in my heart, it's so precious. So I want to keep it from my heart. Right? Let's each of us let's just pray and just tell the Lord that Lord, I want to keep your word. I want my heart. Let my heart keep your word. Father, even as we come before you today, Lord, it's uh, as in, in response to your instruction, God, Lord, we want to treasure your words in our hearts, Lord. We want to keep it, Lord, nurture it, protect it, uh, ensure that we don't lose it. Lord, whatever you're speaking over us, Lord, we, don't, we want to ensure that we don't lose it, God. We want to ensure that it's protected, Lord, because the very reason that you've said, God, that your heart keep, oh God, it's it's possible for us to lose track. It's possible for us to be careless with it, to neglect your word, Master. And Lord, what you have quickened to our heart, may we be careful to keep it, protect it, and may we be careful to treasure it, Lord, esteem it highly as something precious. And may your word change us, may your word convict us, may your word refresh us, Lord, and may your word impart life to us in all those areas that we consider to be barren or consider to be challenging. Lord, today, God, may your word release life. May your word release life, O oh God, because your word is eternal. It is not temporal, God. May the truth of your word, Lord, lead us into freedom and liberty, God, even today, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, seems like we're meeting after a very long time. <laughs> In between 26, we, uh, uh, and the first time also was after a very long time. Anyway, so let's pick up from where we left, right? So, we were looking at, just to give a quick re recap. Uh, we are looking at finances and uh, how we saw in the first class, you know, how God, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, teaching. The Lord Jesus taught a lot more on finances than on anything else, on money and uh, in the in the Gospels, right? You see a lot more teaching on, uh, on money. And we looked at the importance of um, having the right attitude towards money, having the right attitudes towards finances. Okay. And uh, that will actually liberate us. That will actually change our perspective of uh, of of everything. You know how we do ministry, how we do life. Um, it'll be actually life changing. And this is a very uh, important subject. We saw this topic of money and how we handle it because um, you know we need it right to function in the natural world. We need it. And God is not against money. God is not holding back, withholding money. But money can have a hold on us if we are not careful. Okay, so we need to rightly handle money rather than money having a grip on us. Okay, um, so we looked at what are the good attitudes to have about money. What is the mindset to have about money? And we also looked at some of the wrong attitudes 
um, that we could possibly have wrong attitude about money. And we looked at a couple of those. One was covetous covetousness and greed, uh, because it's very easy to want more, more and more, right? Uh, and go beyond what we actually need. And we need to actually have a distinction or difference between what is a want and what is our need. Right, so covetousness, covetousness, and greed is a wrong attitude to have about money. We looked at some scriptures, and we also looked at competition in the sense, you know, we compare and we want to compete in the area of money. Right, and and just because we could, we are you know called to ministry or we are called to be men and women of God, that does not insulate us from this worldly or fleshly way of thinking and doing, right? Uh, thinking and and behavior, uh, acting. So competition, comparing and you know, saying, you know, I want to be better. That person has this. I want this. I, I want to have more of that. I want to be better than this person in this area. Right. Um, then the third one we saw was false spirituality. Okay. It can be about abundance where we come to a conclusion and say, um, you know, this person is really blessed of God and must be doing well spiritually because of the abundance or the opposite of it. Also, this person, you know, does not have any material possession, and so must be a very great man or woman of God. Both are wrong, right? So God does not measure, you know, uh, spiritual maturity or or even spirituality with this kind of a uh, measurement, right? By the met by the things that we have, right? So uh, we looked at that. Uh, okay, so today let's look at. Um, uh, you know another aspect of it of money and how to have the uh, how not to have this attitude right it's a wrong attitude to have see when we uh, money does give a sense of security what does the what does the word security mean hmm? what protection assurance right um, like sometimes we uh, let's say we are going out to a hotel or somewhere you know, we normally check in our wallet, right? We, we make sure that the purse is taken, you know, just pat the guys will you know, just pat the pocket and say, okay, did I take it? Right? Nowadays, of course, you have it on your phone. You can actually use Google Pay, whatever, phone pay. But you normally make sure that it's there. Okay. Just a reassuring factor. Okay. So money does give that sense of reassurance. But the fact is, the one who gives. Okay, the giver is the is the one in whom we should have our trust, okay, not on what we have. Because the you know scripture says that money can be here today and gone tomorrow. Right? It can it need not be there always. But the fact is, the one who is eternal, the one who is the source of all wealth, right? He is with us. So our faith and our trust should not be in the material possession, but be in the giver. Okay. So it. So what is a false sense of security? If I put my trust in money, if I put my trust in the riches, say, okay, this is my future is secure because I have so much in the bank. Right. We we can do this, this, and this, which is true. And but you were saying that you know because I have so much. I can actually do it, right? Now that's a false sense of security. Okay, but the thing is, this we need to understand. Okay, let's look at First Timothy six and verse uh, seventeen. Right, First Timothy six seventeen. Command those who are rich in this present age. Okay, so this is Paul telling Timothy, command. Okay, so which means it's a not an option. Command is we have to do it. Command those who are rich in this present age. What is he commanding? Not to be haughty. Means not to be proud. Okay. Not to not to trust in uncertain riches. Okay. Two things: not to be proud, not to trust in uncertain riches. Okay. Not to be haughty because of material possessions. So I have this, this, this. You know, I live here. I have this. Not to be proud because of it. Not to put your trust in uncertain riches. Okay, he's saying riches have this characteristic of being uncertain. Okay, so not to put your trust in uncertain riches. Look at the last part. But in the living God. Okay, so our pride should not be in material possessions. Now that's a wrong attitude to have. 
nor should I have my trust, put my trust in these riches because they are they are uncertain. So how why should I trust in something that is uncertain? Right? So um, for example, you know, we'll never do that with an, with another human being, you know, in the sense if a person is cannot keep their word, you know, we cannot put our trust in that person. Right? We cannot. We will be. We will not say, "Okay, I'm, I'm going to trust this person with great responsibility," because that person cannot keep their word. They say one thing, they do one thing, another thing altogether. We will not trust. Like saying, "I'm not sure, you know, whether this person will actually come up, this per, or this person says they'd be at, you know, at this particular time they'll be there, but uh, I don't know if I can trust." Right? Uh, let's say you have some guests coming, and at the rail railway station, this, this is the time the train comes. And uh, you won't send such a person to pick them up. Okay. What if they say I slept and I couldn't go, right? And they tell you one hour later, right? I I could not go. Oh, I had something else. I could not go, right? Uncertain. So you will not put your trust in something that's uncertain. So if you're putting your trust in riches, now they have this quality of being uncertain. So do not put your trust in that, right? What is, the, what is the other part? It says, but you put your trust in the living God. Oh, look at that last part. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Okay, God's heart is what? Is a generous heart. So it says that God is the one who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Right? So God is not the one who is holding back. God is not the one who does not want us to enjoy or you know make use of material things. He's the one who gives richly, which means generously, all things to enjoy. So our heart, you know, so we, we could make the mistake and say, okay, God does not want me to have things. God does not want me to enjoy, you know. I have to go through life in pain, in misery, in you know, with a long face. That's not it. it. Says here, God is not the one with this who's with the holding. He's the one who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So, what is my heart posture? God, I'm, I'm going to put my trust in you. Right? I'm not going to put my trust in these things which are uncertain. These are material things. These are uncertain. So I'm not going to put my trust in these things. But in you, who is the living God, you give me all things to enjoy. Okay, So that's the perspective we should have about money. Let's look at another scripture. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, So he's calling these material things as treasure. Okay, So treasure is something of great value or what we consider as great value. Okay, We might say, you know, I treasure these memories. I treasure these memories of all that, you know, of, of, of this particular visit. I treasure these memories. What does that mean? That means that you value it very highly. You esteem it very highly. You know, it's like uh, it's like something precious, right? Um, okay, so um, so you say I treasure it. So where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, so if you're going to treasure and value material things and they are going to be so much part of you know what you, what your heart is captured with and there your heart will be also you know you're going to be there you're going to be your thoughts will be there your everything your energy and everything is going to be there right um, so he's saying do not lay up for yourselves thing so does that mean that you should not work does that mean that because work is going to be blessed with the return you know or does that mean you cannot be in business does that mean you cannot invest what do you think huh what do you think sorry uh, yeah 
but hmm okay anyone else yeah we should honor god hmm okay we should honor god see him as our provider the one who blesses okay yeah else? we we should not make them as our treasures we should not make the treasures our treasure okay that's a nice interesting way anyone online okay so the context the context is Matthew chapter 6, right? Matthew chapter 6, the Lord is talking about worry. Okay. And uh, verse 25 onwards. And he's also, you know, even before we go into verse 25, he's also talking about no one can serve two masters. So it's it's something that you are serving, it's something that you're giving yourselves to. And he's saying no one can serve two masters. And that's how he starts talking about money and and worrying about providing for ourselves, worrying about legitimate necessities okay so he says during the course of that conversation in the teaching the lord jesus says your father knows that you have need of these things okay so if your father knows that you have need what are those things you know what shall i eat what shall i drink what shall i put on clothes if the father knows that which means that these are legitimate needs my father heavenly father the lord is saying your heavenly father knows that you have need of these things right but what he's saying is do not worry about that because when you're worrying your mind is always on what you are worrying your mind is always preoccupied with that right so he's, he's saying do not worry so in the course of that he says uh you know uh this right uh, your life is more than clothing and and, and all that, that right? so when we look at uh, we go further down um uh, to sorry uh, up sorry uh, 19 to 21 and where he says do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal so so in that that is the context of the old message so it doesn't mean that we should not work we should not save we should not invest but is that something that is capturing your heart right or is that something that you're worried about preoccupied about all the time Okay, so it's a very fine line, right? And even the previous verse that we saw, 1 Timothy chapter 6, it's a very, very fine line. You know, do not put your trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who richly gives us all things to enjoy. So he's the one who's richly giving. So it's not about it's not about it's not about the money at all, but where my heart is with regard to the money. Okay. So if, if my heart is right, if I'm going to put my trust in God, then money cannot have a hold on me. No, I will be able to direct it. I will be able to, I'll be an instrument, just like how God has called us to be instruments of righteousness, where he can do what he wants us to do, um, you know, in sharing the gospel, in going and ministering to people. The same thing he can do with money as well. He knows that, okay, this guy is like, you know, it's like a it's like a tube where I can just allow riches to flow through that tube and direct it wherever, channel it wherever I want to give, right? Um, so uh, you know, many examples that we we see uh, you know, throughout history and also you know in contemporary times, we see that people not being captured by money, but allowing God to you know f uh, to let money flow through their hands, right? Um, extremely wealthy, God really blessed them with riches, maybe their business, but they use that to actually further the kingdom of God, further the cause of the kingdom. Okay. So if, if God is going to, if God sees that, okay, your heart is really captured by money and wealth, now he's not going to pour you know, into your life the very thing that is going to destroy you. Right? He'll say, okay, I, I, this is going to destroy my son. This is going to destroy my daughter. Now, why should I you know, do that? So he's going to wait till that adjustment is made, that alignment is made. And then he can say, okay, I can trust him. 
I can trust her. I can trust her to go here, go there, and everywhere. And I don't want, you know, I, I don't want to destroy this person's life, but really allow this person to be an instrument where I can bless other lives. Right? Okay. Yes, yeah, Sean. In Ecclesiastes, huh? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, can you just give me the exact verse, Ecclesiastes? Can you just read it out, please? Um. Hmm. 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 Yeah. So here, you know, all these um, verses actually talk about, um, again, it talks about, you know, he who loves silver will never be satisfied, you know, um, or uh, he who loves abundance, uh, he's not going to be satisfied with that abundance. So the thing is, the you know, again, goes back to the same thing. Where Where is your heart? You know, you can have greed, you can covet things, and you can have more and more of it, but that's not going to bring in fulfillment. Because these are material things, and these are not going to actually that's a negative aspect of money. You know, these are not going to fulfill you and bring you to that place of saying, Okay, I'm satisfied, it'll never happen. You know, there. So, um, and also that was um, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, uh, whether he eats little or much, with the abundance of the rich. Again, um, you know, we're going to look at that other verse where the 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 rich man who actually says, okay, uh, I'm going to build barns, I'm going to do this. But then, you know, he doesn't know that, that his future is actually very limited, right? So if your heart is in it, in that abundance, you're con constantly thinking about, okay, you know, will, will I lose it? Will I, you know, whereas if your heart is in the giver, you know, if my trust is in the giver, that I will not be, of course, I will steward it well. So the difference between stewarding it and um, and be preoccupying, you know, with it. So I will steward it well, uh, but I will not allow that to capture. Me. Yeah. So that's the thing. Right. Okay. So um, Jackin has a question: um, Is it really difficult for a rich man or a woman to know and understand the things of God? We see Jesus himself saying it is difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We read about uh, yeah, and also seen the few men and women of God, the attitudes change once they are blessed materially. Uh, previously, I've seen them God-fearing with a broken, humble spirit. This is my personal thought and question. So, so Jackin, yeah. So, so the, the difficulty is, is this, you know, for a person of great riches, for a person of great wealth, when, when their heart is, again, uh, captured by that rather than uh, God Himself, you know, um, like see, I, I know you, you might be aware of these kind of people who probably their things shifted when they came into riches. You know, the whole thing changed, but that's not the ideal thing, right? So riches have that, uh, you know, hold or influence, but that's why the Lord really warns us not to have that kind of a, uh, you know, a trust in the riches. So. You know, history is also full of people who who have not allowed money to take a hold of them. So, you know, people of great wealth, for them, you know, we're going to look at tithing a little later in the subject. But you see that they, they don't tithe one-tenth, but they're actually, it's more. It's like 50% or maybe 60% or even more because they know where their source is, right? So, they, and their purpose is that God has given me the ability to get wealth, and I'm going to use it for the cause of God's kingdom. Right? God has blessed me so much in order to be a blessing. So, so Paul writes, right? Paul says that he who steals uh, should steal no longer, 
but work, labor with the hands so that he might give to one who has need. So what does that mean? That means that in all labor there is reward, so you're going to receive the benefit of laboring, but it's not, it's to take care of your needs, but you can actually bless someone with it. So if you have that mindset, then it's going to be uh, very liberating and you're going to be a blessing uh, in God's hands to other people, right? Okay. So it's like, uh, so your question is, is it really difficult for a rich man or a woman to know and understand the things of God? Well, the answer is no. no it's not because of the abundance of riches, but your association with association with it. You know, if you're attached to riches, then it's everything is going to cloud. You know, it's it's like a work of the flesh. You know, if you're carnally minded, then you cannot please God, nor can you understand the things of God. So it's the same thing, which is applied here. Okay. Okay, yeah, Sean. If you want to, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. It's difficult, difficult because your heart is pulling you in a different direction. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So can a pastor invest or do business? Okay. 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 Yeah, so so the question, okay, the question here is um, from Anandis, okay, can a pastor invest or run a business or have other sources of income, right? So so that's the thing. Um, so can he do that, or should the pastor just depend on the tithes and offerings which come? Okay, so that's the thing. So the thing is, uh, okay, so it's there's no one answer. The thing is to ask, um, okay, God, what do you want me to do? It goes back to that, right? What you called me to do? What are some things that you put in me? Okay, so if God says, okay, so that's which is what happened in the case of Paul. So Paul had a tent making skill, and because of which he provided for the ministry and the ministry team. That's what we see, right? Um, so that does not mean that he did not take offerings. He did. People gave, and he used that as well. But you know, in certain cases, he would not take. He says, guys, I did not take from you. I didn't want to burden you uh, because I just wanted to do with the work of my hands. So, uh, no. <laughs> See, the thing is this. Okay, let's say, uh, okay, so Anand's question is, okay, I'm getting tithes and offerings. Now, can I use that money to invest? Okay, so the, the thing is this. You know, from the tithes and offerings, what is, let's say, uh, you know, it varies again. Depending on the size of the church, now, I think you learned more in church administration about this in uh, I think next semester or so. Um, so, but the thing is this, you know, like from the tithes and offering that you're getting, okay. So, how much of it is your salary? Okay, let's say if it's a small church, okay, tithes and offerings you get, and that's all you have to live. Everything is what you use for maybe the rent, maybe your uh, the church rent, or uh, saying, you know, all, all the expenses of running the ministry is from that. So you just use that. But if, uh, if from that tithes and offerings, there is some amount of money which is yours, okay, which, which is like for your, your, your personal use. Okay? You, you, you do what you want with that, <laughs> right? Uh, you want to give it to, to people, you want to invest in something, you want to buy some land, that is yours. But if it's the entire tithes and offerings coming in and the church's policy is some amount is to the pastor, some amount is used for this, then you need to get the okay, you know, from the thing. But I would say, don't even go there. What is your personal thing? You use it, right? So, and on also the topic of, okay, uh, can a pastor, you know, run a business? We know the answer is yes, you know, you can, you can do that. I, I know a pastor who was in Nagpur, uh, who was actually uh, who was doing catering business. Okay. There also you need to be careful, 
you have people in church getting married and all then you, you say okay you take my business <laughs> you know you can put emotional pressure you know i'm solemnizing the wedding you know why can't i provide the thing you, you should not do that you know uh, so there's a danger in that but he had this catering business okay because he had no other thing church was also i think kind of small not much so he was running the software business and i'm uh, sorry catering business but the thing is this you know so uh, is that taking you away from the primary vision that god has given you right? what is the thing that is asked you to do uh, it goes back to that if somewhere that vision is getting diluted <laughs> and uh, you're all about you know building the next uh, catering thing uh, and then you're not really involved in you know thing then you need to take a call right? okay um what, some more thoughts from nina a little more on the treasures in heaven. That's what we have to store apart from seeking his kingdom. Um, yeah. Not to focus on earthly treasures is understandable. Okay, so what are these treasures in heaven? Lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Um, uh, I really, uh, I'm not too sure, you know, I'm not, of course, we, we see that God wants to reward us. Uh, and there is a reward for uh, every believer. Uh, but... Um, uh, what is it? I really uh, maybe I can just look into it. You can also check and see what are these treasures in heaven. That uh, yeah, I'm not too sure about the details of that. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Sorry. Sorry. What? what? Worries. Not to worry. Right? No, I didn't understand your question. Sorry. Uh, um, not really. You know, if you're looking at verse 19, uh, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. It's, it's talking about material things, not really about uh, worry. But further down, he says, don't worry about these legitimate needs that you have. Um, these are legitimate things. Father knows. Don't worry about it. So that's uh, like 25 onwards. Now he's talking about worry. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. Any, any further questions uh, or thoughts? Okay, let's look at, um, you know, Luke chapter 12, um, verse 16. He spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? You know, this is a great situation to be in for the businessman. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, build greater, and I will store all my crops and my goods. Right? This is also good. Right? It's, it's what any rational businessman would do. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, so the, all, the initial things that he thought were all very practical. This is what anybody would do. You know, anybody who's in business is there for the profit, is there for the growth. Nobody is there for the loss, right? So uh, till verse eighteen, it makes sense. Verse nineteen, he says, you know, so you have many goods laid up for many years. So what is he doing there? What is he telling himself? What do you learn from that? Yeah, he's basing his future on what he has gathered so far. Right? His, his security, his surety is, I have so much in my barn. Okay, so you just take it easy, relax, eat, be, eat, you know, merry, enjoy. Um, so then God says, fool the night, your soul will be required of you then whose will those these things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself. Look at that other part of the verse. And is not rich towards God. Okay. So here's a selfish thing. And on top of that, we see based on his response to whatever wealth he has got, his trust is in that. His confidence is that. Confidence from a future is, Hey, I've got so much. So that is all there is. Right. So the Lord is saying, you know, that is so short-lived. 
uh, and uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be you know required of you. Your life is required of you. Your soul is required of you. And whose things will those be? Okay, so you think about that. Right? So you are not thinking in terms of eternity, right? And your trust is in the wrong place. Okay, so um, Chaya, you are saying, what are you? Matthew six thirty three is what? Yeah. Okay, you're just reiterating that. Seek first the kingdom priority. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's look at another verse. Okay. So all this we are looking at. Um, it, it is the about security, and the the reason we are dwelling on it is to really know the difference. Okay, we are we are looking at all these verses. We're looking at all this really to know that God's heart is not for you to not have riches. Okay. Sometimes that's the thing, no? Uh, say, I met recently uh, a friend who was saying, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you are, you know, you are in ministry and not going in the ways of the world. Okay. What that friend meant was the fact that you're not working anywhere else <laughs> and you're working for the church or you're doing ministry. But, but really, working else, elsewhere is not the way of the world. Really not. Because God would want you to be there. God would want to be want you to be in, you know, to be in politics, to be in governance, you know, whatever. So the thing is not the 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 problem is not you know us having riches. God does not have a problem with that, but God really doesn't want those riches to destroy us. So where your heart, where is your heart? Okay, we need to be really, really sure. We need to be really, really convinced about this, because. You know, we if we go into ministry and full time, so called full time ministry, or you know, we need to be sure, we need to be clear that God is not God is giving this so that I can use it. I don't need to, you know, have this. I I I, I need to protect myself from this having a hold on me. Okay, so we need to have the attitude. Okay, whether it's great riches or whether you know there's nothing at all, my trust will continue to be in God. Okay, and I'm going to be a willing vessel. That God uses. Okay, okay. One more verse, uh, one John chapter two, verses fifteen and sixteen. Okay, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Okay. So, question again. Okay, how can I not love the world? John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, so we understand it as, he goes on to clarify, right? For all that is in the world, which means he's talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Okay, and money can actually contribute or even fuel these things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Right, uh, in position and power and status and so on, uh, money can actually fuel that. So all that is in the world is talking about the world system. It's talking about the lusts of these things. This is not of the Father. Right? If you're going to have your love for this, then the love of the Father is not in Him. Right. So again, it's a thing. You know, how can I have money and not be in love with it? How can I use money and not be held back by it? Oh, that's a great place to come to, right? Like growing up, you yeah, see, we didn't have much money. Okay, so I, I think I shared with you, right? My mother said when I asked for the pencil box that my friend had in the class, said we are not rich people. So I always grew up uh, saying, okay, we're not rich. <laughs> I didn't have the wrong attitude towards money, but the thing is. I would hold on tightly. Okay. Now, if there was thing, I'll try to stretch it. If there was this thing, I'll use it for this, that, and the other, and you know, and really hold tightly to it. Right? Then I got married. Then my wife also went through a similar background. Like they didn't have much growing up. But surprisingly, her attitude was just give it. It's fine. Okay. So um I'm like, 
uh, I remember like you newly married and walking, uh, you know, on Brigade Road. It was, it was in winter, so I had actually uh, bought a woolen cap for her. Okay, so woolen cap and uh, for her and saying uh, it's a gift. Now this is you know we got married in December, end of December. I'm talking about January okay, when it's still cold and we are walking and saying so. Uh, I just gave her this gift and she had that and. And then she, we, as we were walking, we saw a mother and a child. So child, uh, you know, very, uh, it was very cold. And then that um, they didn't have proper warm clothing. And they were, so immediately she took the cap and put it on the child. Okay. For me, it was like, how can you do that? <laughs> you know, it was my gift to you. And uh, how can you do that? How can you just take it in an instant? She just saw the need, she took it and then put it in. And I thought it was nothing. I said, yeah, it was a gift. I don't, uh, you know, I'm not worried. I, I, you know, uh, it's not like I value your love any less or anything. But the fact is that there was a need. And I'm just going to give it. Right? So that's the difference. You know, for me, I, at that point in time, I, I was holding on. And I was like, no, this is... This is mine. This is it. You know, uh, but the fact is that. You know, so God had to actually take me through a series of events and incidents to really free me from that and say, hey, "I'm the provider. No, don't be caught up by my provision. I've given you something. Don't just make an idol out of it. Don't treasure it. Make an idol out of it. I'm the one you need to trust. I can give you more of it. Just give it away." Right, so there are many examples. Probably we look at uh, one such uh, thing that happened in our life, also. Um, yeah, so don't love the world or the things in the world. This is the context. Okay, um, okay. Let's move on to um, yeah. Let's look at uh, the, the last uh, scripture that is listed there in the notes. Um, Matt, uh, sorry, Jeremiah chapter nine, twenty-three to twenty-four. Thus says the Lord: Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight. Okay, so the Lord is saying, okay. Uh, you might have these attributes. You might have wisdom. You might have strength. You might have riches. Nothing wrong, but don't take just pride in it or don't glory in it. Okay, but let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me. Okay, so which means more than wisdom, more than our physical abilities, skill, talent, right, strength, and our possessions. What we need to treasure and esteem very highly is that hey, I know God and He knows me. Right? Our relationship with Him is to be treasured above all else. Okay? Our heart is really to be captured by, the, by you know, or, or to be uh, that He needs to be, you know, capturing our heart. We need to allow Him to capture our heart, right, more than anything else, right? Okay. So, uh, any th any thoughts here? Any questions here? Okay. So it is a challenging thing, right? This is completely opposite of what the world would believe, and this could be completely, you know, opposite of even some, unfortunately, ministries or you know, people of God would be living their life, right? It could be, but. We need to make that alignment early on. We need to, you know, really make that alignment. Say, Lord, my heart is sold out for you, for your purposes. Let nothing. We talk about okay, people. We talk about you know, let nothing capture my heart. Let nothing come into place, right? Okay. So, um, so next class we look at uh, biblical prosperity, um, and then. Um, we we'll look at some very very interesting, um, you know, incidents. We're going to look at some people in the Bible. Many times we look at these personalities. We think they were poor, 
Okay. Or actually, if you look at their lives, the kind of things, because in, in this one line, Bible states, they had many possessions, they had flocks, they had this. If you actually translate it to today's language, you would see that they were wealthy people. Okay. So that will also change our mindset. Uh, and, you know, the fact that we need to be humble, keep our focus on God. Right. Okay. So we'll stop here. And uh, we'll catch up in the next class. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, online students. Bye-bye.